I'd like to welcome you all here to our public information meeting on the Sheboygan River cleanup and restoration. It's a really exciting evening for many of us, and thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to learn more about the Sheboygan River. And I'd like to also start out by thanking the John Michael Kohler Arts Center for working with us so that we could have this event here this evening. My name is Debbie Beyer. I'm with University of Wisconsin Extension as a natural resources educator, and I'll be uh, serving as MC for this evening, and we have a great lineup of speakers to share just a wealth of information with you and background on the Sheboygan River uh, projects that are coming up. So as you arrive tonight, Hopefully you stopped at the sign-in table. I know it was a little congested there here towards the end. Um, we had some handouts that hopefully you picked up, and I'm just going to go through a few things to kind of guide you through the evening here. Uh, first, there is a little half-sheet uh, program agenda for the evening. gives you a list of the presentations. So we're going to start out with some uh, uh, opening comments from the EPA the Wisconsin DNR, and also uh, the county and the city of Sheboygan. We will then follow with uh, about a half hour presentation from the US EPA Great Lakes Legacy Act project. This is Heather Williams, the project manager. And then that will be followed by a Corps of Engineers uh, project presentation from Terry Long, who's the project manager for that followed by Tom Sear, who's with SEH Incorporated, who is doing some contract work on habitat restoration projects for the city of Sheboygan. After those presentations, just before 8 o'clock, we will be uh, kind of adjourning the formal part of the meeting and dispersing back out into the community gallery that you entered and saw all of the posters and exhibits. And that is where we would like folks to have discussions with the staff that are out there and ask your questions and let your thoughts be known. In addition to that one-on-one -on -one interaction, we do have comment forms that hopefully you picked up at the sign-in table, and we'd like you to use those as well. If you have some questions that don't get answered tonight here in person, you can jot your question down or your comment and fill it in turn it in at the comment box that's at that sign-in table where you first came in. And someone would be getting back to you with an answer to your question. Also, if you didn't pick one up yet before you leave tonight, there was a Sheboygan River Explorer newsletter at the sign-in table, and there's a wealth of information in there. Some of it's kind of overview of presentations for tonight but also there's information for if you have uh, family or friends or associates that weren't able to make it to the meeting tonight. Um, there's information on the front page for um, accessing these presentations over the uh, internet or through WSCS TV8. And so there's information for gaining access to those presentations that way after the fact. So please share that with folks you know that are also interested. Additionally, um, there's a magnet out there as well with a website address to help you keep in touch with all the things that are going on. So uh, this is something you could pick up too to help remind you where to go for information. So as a kind of an orientation to the evening, I'd like to move into just saying that this is a very exciting time for the Sheboygan River. Um, there are many, many people, probably several hundred, working on the various projects that we're going to be reviewing and, and learning about tonight. A few of the people in the room here, I'm sure uh, I know of a few, who have been working for this day for over 30 years. So that's a long time, and we've come a long way. <clears throat> so without taking more of your time, I'm going to turn the podium over to our uh, presenters who wanted to make some opening comments. And so we'll have Mark Tuckman from the US EPA Great Lakes Legacy Program, followed by Steve Galarno, Director of the Wisconsin DNR's Office of Great Lakes, followed by Adam Payne, our Sheboygan County Executive, and then Chad Pelishek from the City uh, Planning Office. 
He's the development director. So Mark. Thanks, Deb, and thanks everybody for coming tonight. Um, we really appreciate your participation and interest in this project. Deb used the word exciting. That, that's the way I was gonna start off my presentation was this is really an exciting time and exciting year for the Sheboygan River. Thanks to the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative and the funding that it provides, we really think that this year we'll be able to do some amazing things on the Sheboygan River. Um, the Sheboygan River was, was denoted as one of four priority AOCs for conducting cleanup and restoration actions around the Great Lakes. So a lot of resources and a lot of effort will be put into the Sheboygan River over this coming year to do, to do these actions that will hopefully move the Sheboygan River towards delisting it as an AOC. So the actions that we're proposing, there are three major actions and that's where the presentations will focus on tonight. There's the Great Lakes Legacy Act project. We'll have a presentation on that by Heather Williams. The, there's the core strategic navigation uh, dredging project that's downstream of the A Street Bridge. And there's six habitat restoration projects that will be taking place over this, over this next year. All this work is being funded through the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. So there's the potential for over $35 million in federal Great Lakes Restoration Initiative funds to come into the Sheboygan River this year to conduct this work. Now agreements still need to be signed. Um, these deals are not all in place yet. Um, so you know things still, still are a little bit fluid. We're hoping the Great Lakes Legacy Agreement will be signed in the next two weeks. That's being negotiated right now between EPA and our project sponsors. Um, the Corps of Engineers project is still under negotiation. So, these, so we're, we're hoping that in three to four weeks, all these projects will, be, will be, have agreements signed and will be ready to roll. Um, I, just, um, I would be remiss, really, if I didn't acknowledge the partners who have been working with us um, over the last two years on this project. Adam, I know, is going to get into this a little bit more, but there are some, some groups that really have been hugely responsible for getting this to where we are today. Wisconsin DNR has provided immense financial and technical resources, uh, specifically Steve Galarno and Vic Pappas have been hugely instrumental working with us all the way through. The Corps of Engineers has come on to this project lately, but have really focused on the project from 8th Street down and have really put a lot of effort, a lot of resources into that strategic navigation project. Wisconsin Public Service, have, have, uh, they just concluded a Superfund project, but they provided $100,000 in design money for the Great Lakes Legacy Project. And PRS has been a, a, a technical contributor and a coordinator with us um, in this project. Also, from a local standpoint, I mean, the, the, these projects don't happen unless you have local community involvement and support. And you've had some, some leaders in this community who have really stepped up on this project from the uh, from Sheboygan County, you know, a Adam Payne has been a force behind this project. He, he has just made sure this project has kept moving ahead and, um, and, and really has been a huge, um, had a huge impact on moving the sort where we are today. From the city of Sheboygan, Mayor Bob Bryan, Chad Pelishek, Steve Sokolowski, they've all had huge roles. They provided great input, logistical input. They've helped us with staging areas and um, helped us with permits. So the, the local, you know, the local impact and the local input has been huge to getting us where we are today. So really a great thanks to the local community. But at the end of the day, it's really about the river. It's about having a clean river. It's about having a river we can, we can, that you can recreate on, that you can enjoy. And that's a clean river and it's, and it's an environmental and an economic asset to the community. So at the end of the day, that, that's, that's what it's all about. And that's where we're all our whole group our whole and our whole team is moving forward so anyway i'm looking forward to an exciting and productive year and i think um, i'm hoping that you know we can come back at the end of the year and really talk about how how what a great job we did and really talk about the successes so anyway thank you very much for your time Okay, you've had a number of people say it's exciting. I agree, but I'll say it's fun. I mean, this has been a long time getting to this point. Um, just to kind of give you a better feel for how long it is, I have a slide for every day that we've been... No, not really. Um, but we are... Um, because of the EPA and the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, we're one of the few areas where we have an area of concern 
that we are going to be implementing all of the actions that we believe necessary to delist. This is not a common occurrence. This is a huge uh, thing we're accomplishing here in Wisconsin and something you should feel very proud of here uh, locally. It's a, it is a big deal. Um, I'm going to tell a little bit of the story because I know there's folks that have been involved in this uh, for many years. I recognize a lot of the folks out here uh, have been working on, on this for years. Um, we have Superfund actions that occurred out here, so I just want to make sure I can tell the, the story a little bit because the Superfund did a, uh, a terrific job of stepping up to the plate. Um, the company's doing what they need to do to fulfill their part. But as you recall, when we were having some of our public meetings, it, was, uh, it became apparent to the locals and to the state um, that some of the future use of the river was not going to be um, what the locals and the state wanted to see. There were going to be some contamination that was legitimately being left at greater depths. And that's because uh, what you need to accomplish for Superfund was not necessarily the same thing what we wanted to see for the really deep uh, dredging potential and uh, navigation concerns. That's where the legacy program really played an important factor in being able to come in and meet that, uh, that much needed uh, need for the greater depth, removing a lot more contamination, and that's some of the stories you'll be uh, hearing about today. Critical partnership between all these different programs. The funds that were um, spent by the company doing the super fund helped provide that critical match money needed for the legacy program. So. Uh, very exciting. It's all about a lot of different companies, the companies, the uh, agencies, the locals, all these different entities sitting around a table, not saying I can't do this, but sitting down and troubleshooting and figuring out how do we get this job done. And we're here now and we're going to see a tremendous number of things get accomplished this year. Um, you heard about some of the partners and I wanted to identify a, a couple of partners that have been involved early on, before the GLRI came in with uh, money, the Sheboygan River Basin Partnership um, really played some critical uh, role here. I saw Pete Pittner, um, I'm hoping John Gumtall's out here too, as well. Um, please say hello to them and, and share um, thanks for their, their hard work and their continued work because they're working on the area concerned fish and wildlife um, technical advisory committee now. So you get a chance to ask a lot of questions tonight, learn uh, what this project is about, and there are um, ways you can still be involved in helping uh, see this done. So please stop at some of the tables, and if you have an interest in um, helping to participate, uh, please do so. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. This is awesome. I mean, it's just awesome to see this kind of turnout tonight. I couldn't believe when I walked in and saw that many people lined up and getting information and, and being here to participate in the process. And I want to thank UW Extension and Dev in particular for, for helping lead, just coordinating this tonight. Uh, my name is Adam Payne. I'm the Sheboygan County Administrator. I've been here 13 years, and it is a privilege to be a part of this process and this team. It's a privilege. I can't believe the resources and the teamwork that's come to bear to bring us to this. You know, Steve and Mark talk a little bit of all the work that's gone into it over the, the decades, all the good work by people, many of which that aren't here tonight. I've just had the chance to be involved the last few years, perhaps the last couple of years or the last six months in particular, depending on the intensity of this and how it's increased. One of the things that makes me tick, and I'm sure many of you in this room, is you like to be part of making good things happen. Making your community better, doing the best you can in your job, just being part of a, a successful team. And I'm blessed to be surrounded by outstanding employees at Sheboygan County, and Aaron Brault is here this evening. He's our Planning and Conservation Director. He's been providing such a critical leadership role. The City of Sheboygan, Chad Pelichek, he's been providing a key leadership role. We've got some good local teams in place. But then it got broadened for us. And when you think about the Environmental Protection Agency and the Corps of en Army Corps of Engineers and the Department of Natural Resources, Sheboygan County, City of Sheboygan, UW Extension, the town of Sheboygan Falls, the private sector, all the different stakeholders that have been involved with this, it is amazing. It is amazing 
and a privilege to be part of a process where everyone is striving to collaborate, problem solve, work together to see this through. It's just been incredible. Many of you in this room may have questions or concerns tonight. Let me assure you, the representatives that are going to be before you tonight and in that hallway later are just exemplary people, superb people with a passion and a desire to see this through for the benefit of our community. I am so proud and privileged to be a part of this group, this team that's been working on it. Ask your questions. If you need more information, it'll be provided. But don't hesitate to get engaged and make sure your questions and concerns are addressed. So I just want to say thank you for being a part of this. The opportunity for Sheboygan County, what it means to our community, to once and for all eliminate this designation, ultimately eliminate the uh, not to eat the fish warnings, to have the economic development opportunities here, what it's going to mean for this generation and future generations. I want to be part of that legacy. And I'm certain you do as well. And again, I really want to thank the representatives of the agencies and stakeholders that have been a part of this because they are some wonderful, hardworking, dedicated individuals. Again, thank you for being here tonight. Last but not least, I'm Chad Pelishek with the City Planning Department, and I just want to thank everybody for being here as well. And what I wanted to kind of end with, and a lot of people have talked about stuff prior to this, is uh, we've taken on the Planning Department in the first floor of City Hall has taken on the role of the local contact for this project. Um, I know there's a lot of people, I've talked to a lot of people in the last couple of weeks that are some frustrated, some excited, some not sh so sure of what's going to happen, what's going to face me, where do I park my boat, where do I, how do I get out of the downtown, how much truck traffic do I have to face, the list goes on. And I guess what we want to say is we're trying to address as many concerns, questions as people have. Um, if there's questions moving forward, be happy to stop in our office, give us a call. The mayor's office, our office are happy to direct you to the proper people to get those answers. Um, one, of the con you know, one of the things we've dealt with is, Mark in uh, mentioned in the beginning, this is still a fluid project. We don't have any sound drawings. We don't know for sure what's going to happen. There's a lot of speculation out there of what the impact is going to be. And from a city standpoint, all I'm asking is that you work with us as a stakeholder in this, and we look forward to 2013 and what it can bring for our community. Um, so with that, I would just like to close. But if there is any further questions, concerns about uh, locally that need to be addressed, we're here to answer them to the um, as much information as we have available. Um, there's been a lot of struggles. There's been a lot of stuff we've overcome, and there's a lot more to happen with uh, in particular, the impacts that are going to happen in the river going forward. So hopefully most of your questions will be answered. We'll be out in the hall. We'll be happy to address them, and, and I thank you for your time. Hey, good evening, folks. Uh, hello, my name is Heather Williams. I'm with the U.S. EPA Great Lakes National Program Office. And I'm the project manager for the Legacy Act sediment project. Uh, and I'm also very happy to be here today and happy to have so many people here hear about the details of this project. Uh, you've heard the folk, everyone mention that there's been a, a great many people working on this. Um, and several of us have been very involved in developing the details of this project. And we're just happy to, to share it with you and, and transfer the information about, about what we know about the Legacy project to date. Um, so there's, there has been a, a few sediment projects going on in the past year. Um, last year we did have two sediment projects on the water in Sheboygan, and I will touch on those a little bit tonight. Um, but mostly tonight you're going to hear about sediment projects that are going to happen this year. And the Great Lakes Legacy Act is one of those projects. The second project is the Army Corps project, and Terry Long with the Army Corps is going to give that presentation next. Um, so a little bit about the Legacy Act program. We are uh, a program geared for sediment remediation. We are a sediment cleanup program. So that is our intent. Um, and the mechanisms that we use are partnership agreements. 
So you've heard a lot of people talk about the wonderful partnership uh, that's gone into this project, and it's really true, even to the level of designing this project. So everything that you're going to hear tonight about the Legacy Act, all of the project partners have had input into, um, provided comments on, shared concerns, shared technical information. So there's been so many people, agencies, and entities that have gone into this planning. So we, the Legacy Act does need to work within areas of concern. This is a map of the areas of concern around the Great Lakes. And what an area of concern is, is rivers and harbors on the Great Lakes that have some sort of uh, industrial pollution, the, the sediments are contaminated, and that they suffer from loss of natural habitat. So there's a great effort to attend to these areas of concern to improve the quality of the rivers as a whole. So Sheboygan is an area of concern. Uh, Steve mentioned a little bit about the process of removing the Sheboygan River from this list. And we hope to implement all the actions necessary to do that. And the large part of that is the sediment work. Sediment remediation projects, as well as the habitat remediation projects that you're going to hear about tonight. And ultimately, the intention is to remove the advisories in place at the river and to improve natural habitat along the river. There will be monitoring efforts that need to take place, but the goal is to remove Sheboygan from this areas of concern list. So a little bit about the historical contamination of the river sediments. Uh, we have one of the, the two main contaminants in the river is PCBs that you've probably heard about, read about in information about this evening and about these projects. It's po polychlorinated biphenyls. This is a chemical used in industry before it was banned in the 1970s and it is present in the sediments in the river. It's a toxic compound and in particular PCBs accumulate through the food chain. Uh, the other constituents in the river we're concerned about are called PAHs and NAPL material. These are really indicators of petroleum contamination. So they're sort of like a, a heavier petroleum compounds, oils and tars in the river. Uh, a large part of the PAHs are associated with an old manufactured gas plant that was situated across from Boat Island, the area of uh, Riverside Park in the early part of 1900s. So consequently from this contamination, we have two Superfund sites, as Steve mentioned, on the river. A little bit about each of these. Uh, the Sheboygan River and Harbor Superfund site is the PCB cleanup project. This is being completed by Pollution Risk Services, and they were one of the two entities out dredging last year. Uh, the Superfund site includes 14 miles of the river from Sheboygan Falls all the way to the harbor. Um, there has been upland cleanup work performed in the 80s and 90s, uh, as well as sediment work done in the upper river in 2006 and 2007. So the current sediment project uh, is a hydraulic dredging project. This is a picture of one of the two dredges that they had out last year. So they will be, um, they were there all last year, but they, and they will be in the water this year as well, starting hopefully when weather breaks in April and uh, working through, this should be completed in uh, August timeframe. The other Superfund site is the Camp Marina site. This was the manufactured gas plant site, and Wisconsin Public Service performed this cleanup this year. This was removal of the NAPL material just across from Boat Island, and they did complete this project in December. So why another cleanup site? Steve sort of discussed this briefly. The Superfund projects were required to do what they were required to do. For the PCBs, it was spelled out in a record of decision. And for Camp Marina, it was written out in an emergency action agreement. So there is this remaining sediment, and that is something that the Great Lakes Legacy Act can attend to. Uh, so we are performing our work as a betterment to the Superfund projects. So where is all this happening? We have several maps. Um, there will be several poster maps out in the hallway area for this project and for the Army Corps project. 
Um, but briefly, this is the area of your downtown. Um, and the, uh, in general, the areas here identified with orange arrows is the Superfund reach and the Legacy Act project reach. The area of the yellow area, yellow arrow, is the Army Corps project. So everything I'm going to be discussing tonight, and really the area of the remaining contamination that we'll be taking out, is upstream from the 8th Street Bridge. And Terry Long from the Army Corps will talk about things downstream from 8th Street. OK, and I do just want to point out the project partners, because as everyone has said many times, they've just been so instrumental in getting this all put together and accomplished. It's been a great team of people. Um, and these are, these are the six entities on the project agreements for the Legacy Act. And we wouldn't be here today, as Mark mentioned, by the contributions from uh, your city, your county, and your state, as well as Wisconsin Public Service, donating that initial $100,000 each to start this project. <coughs> OK, so just briefly, what does a Legacy Act project entail? Um, four basic steps. The first step being site characterization work. This is the actual sampling, going out, figuring out what do we have, where is the contamination, how deep is it, what levels do we have in the river. Uh, step two is called a feasibility study. This is our evaluation of what ways can we possibly get this material out. What are the alternatives that we could put in place? We're finishing up step three now, and this is the design work. How are we going to do it? How are we going to go about getting this material out? This is all the details involved in leading up to construction. Permits, uh, staging areas, depths on dredging, um, and specifications. And then step four is to hit the water and start dredging. So we like to get our uh, EPA sampling boat out as often as possible. And we were able to bring the RV Mud Puppy 2 to Sheboygan um, for sampling this past November. But most of our sampling effort was performed in fall of 2010. Um, and many groups, both Superfund entities, took samples in 2009 and before. Um, so really, there's a tremendous amount of data on this river. Uh, we were worried and, and wanted to know how deep the contamination went. Many of our cores went to refusal, hitting the hard clay in the bottom of the river or we went down 10 and up to 35 feet into the sediment. Uh, for this area, for the Legacy Act project, we had over 2,900 sampling points of information on PCBs and PAHs. So we really have a good understanding of where the contamination is. Okay, feasibility study, again, is our evaluation. And I just want to point out, this gets a little technical, but I do want you to understand how we came up with this project. Um, all of that 2,900 data points goes into a three-dimensional model. And then we're able to look at the areas of contamination uh, with, with different color coding ranges for different concentrations. So we can visually see where the contamination is in the river. We're able to look at the Superfund projects. Um, this was a great tool for developing our project and ultimately coming up with the recommended alternative. So this is just a picture showing you all of the data points. It's right in the middle of our project reach, and it's probably hard to tell where it is. But I just want you to note that all of these dots are the sampling locations. And they're color coded by the contaminant level of PCBs. So the red dots show, in this picture, PCBs over 50 parts per million. So the computer model is then able to take this and generate zones of contamination. So we can really see that visual um, depiction of where the contamination is, how deep it is, and use this in our design. So from this information, we established what is our removal criteria. This is what we're going to take out. So essentially, some things were a main focus. We wanted to get as much PCBs and PAHs out of the system. So it's a mass removal idea. How can we get the most material out? There was also a focus on what's called Tosca material. This is that red dot. This is anything over 50 parts per million. We wanted to get as much of this material out as possible. 
And then for this project, there was also a focus on the near surface sediments, um, meaning that anything below 10 feet of the water line, we really wanted to do um, a more critical evaluation so that in the future, that material that would come back and be deposited would be clean. There wouldn't be a concern for future dredging. So we have different criteria for the first 10 feet of material below the low water line. And here's just presenting the criteria. This is what we will be dredging to. This is what we will hope to clean up from the river. And so there is a difference between the first 10 feet and below 10 feet. We'll be going to one part per million PCBs and 18 parts per million PAHs down to 10 feet. Below that, we'll be going to five parts per million PCBs. And then in the area of Boat Island, we mentioned that was the manufactured gas plant. We'll be going to 18 parts per million deeper there, as deep as we need to go. So this results in a volume right now of about 191,000 yards, a pretty good volume of material. So with that information, then, where do we dredge? It's hard to see this picture right now, but there's a poster of it out in the hall. So you can take a look at the dredge lines, um, and, and we can discuss and ask questions out in the poster area afterwards. But this will show you where our dredge cut lines. So this matches up to that criteria and um, in an effort to get as much PCBs out of the system. So a little bit about what our project is going to encompass. This will be a mechanical dredging project. So similar equipment to what was out at the Camp Marina project this year. Um, we want to try and get all this material out in one season. So we do plan to have two to three different dredge units on the water at one time. There's different water elevations. We'll have different types of equipment out. But there'll be several um, excavators loading into barges along the river. And in order to get this work completed, we will be doing the dredging on a 24-hour basis. There will be turbidity control set up. We will have an air curtain at the um, 8th Street Bridge to control turbidity. We have silk curtains if necessary, but we'll also be monitoring for turbidity around each of the dredges upstream and downstream of the project. So staging areas are really important with any sediment work. Um, this is where you offload the material on land from the barges. And this is in the downtown stretch of Sheboygan. We really are very limited as to open areas for staging. Uh, so this is where material is brought on, on land and dewatered. It's dewatered for two reasons. We need to be able to transport it, uh, and, then we, and also for landfill disposal, it needs to be dewatered. Um, so dewatering will include probably mixing with the stabilizing agent. This is so in staging areas, it's loaded into trucks and taken to the landfill. So our project is going to use two staging areas. We will be using the staging area that the Camp Marina project used this past year. Um, so the, across from Boat Island in the Riverside Park area. The second area we plan to use is the Windsor property. This is Wisconsin Naval Ship Association site. They uh, it used to be the Alliant Energy Building. There's still a substation there. But we're hoping to use that property as our second staging area. It's down in the right corner. So a little bit of our project timeline. Uh, as Mark mentioned, I think it was Mark, that we have project agreements to sign. We have a project agreement now with all of our partners for the work we're doing currently, and then we'll have a, a project agreement for the remediation portion. Um, really, that, that sort of lets us go on construction. Uh, at that point, we, with weather permitting, we'll start the staging area development of those two staging sites. Um, we hope to be in the water dredging by May and completing in September. Uh, sand cover placement as necessary and demob from the staging areas in the fall. So this is a Legacy Act project we're estimating right now between 20 and 28 million dollars. 
Again, we're moving about 191,000 cubic yards. That number may go up a little as we reach final design. And the big push here is that not only are we taking out that many yards of sediment, but that we're removing a substantial amount of PCBs from the system, which is what, what we want to do. Uh, 1,840 pounds of PCBs, these are estimates, and about over 37,000 pounds of PAHs. So really remarkable. So we have, um, uh, there's a lot of information here, and there's more information out on the posters. We have people here tonight from EPA, and also people representing all of our project partners, as well as the people that have helped put together the design, and people who may be involved in the construction this year. So we look forward to questions and discussions after the presentations. Um, I think that's it for me. So thank you very much. Good evening. My name is Terry Long with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers out of Detroit District. I'm the Chief of Plan Formulation Branch and what we're responsible for is conducting studies in order to implement for dredging operations. Uh, with me tonight, since there will be other questions, I have some other team members we're going to talk about. I have with me the Chief of uh, Design and Cost Engineering. You want to raise your hand, Bill? Sure. Thank you. Uh, I also have the Chief of Environmental Analysis Branch, Charlie Ularic. I've also brought with me a chemical specialist. We have Pam Horner. And we also brought Bridget Rowan Environmental Specialist, just, just so that I know you'll be asking questions later on and that way you can address them. Thanks. It's going to work. Ah. Okay. This area particularly that we're showing is, is the area that the Corps is uh, involved in. Uh, originally, um, the, the draft of the harbor was around 21 feet. Although things have changed, it was originally commercial harbor. Now it's, you know, it's more of a, a recreational type. So the justification to be able to dredge it to that depth is, is decreased, and it's more difficult to get funding also to dredge. Let me go on to this. Ah. One of the tasks we have to do is perform a uh, study in order to be able to justify the dredging operation. Uh, and that's called the Dredging General Management Plan. This is something that we've um, conducted. What that does, it, it explains the type of dredging, uh, how we would go about doing it, uh, the cost comparisons to different alternatives, would it be mechanical dredging, hydraulic dredging, where would we place it? All those things are considered uh, in, in that operation. And I've got to say, though, that uh, I don't know how many people understand that uh, we really want to thank the EPA for being able to funding this at this point. This harbor hasn't been dredged since 1969. Uh, and, and one of the reasons it's, it's not considered a high priority uh, compared when it's got to compete against commercial harbors that are larger, larger and the shipping capacity is um, uh, a lot higher than and it would mean here. So uh, really. They've really come through and helped us. They're providing funding to do the study and, and for the actual dredging operation itself. So as part of this task, we have to do an actual dredging management plan. And like I said, we're looking at uh, this is a one-time dredge. This is not a 20-year dredging operation plan that you would typically we would typically do on this. And like I said, we, we talked about different types of equipment and methods uh, that was done and analyzed it, and that's how we come up with this final recommended plan. The goal right now is to be able to complete operations by the end of this fiscal year, which for the government it's uh, September 30th, 2012, and then again, that's, that's, that's a goal. As part of this, part of this uh, process, uh, the rules are that the local sponsor has to provide lands, easements, and rights away for a place to put the material. Uh, the county and, and the city have certainly stepped up to this point and provided a place for us to do this. Uh, I can tell you I've been doing this for about 27 years. And it makes a difference on how well cooperative a sponsor is. It'll basically make or break a project. And in this case, uh, they really come through, and everyone, all the other agencies have come through. And it, uh, I, I can tell you, I've done a lot of these all across the Great Lakes, and it does, it truly does make a difference. On this uh, drawing here, um, the the original depth was 21 feet. Uh, do you do cost constraints on that? Uh, we're not going to be doing that. Uh, there was a lot of coordination between the local, I mean, the local fishermen and looking at giraffes and what was needed. And the city had coordinated and said, what are the real needs? 
and what do we have to do, what do we have to have to really make this work and be able to have a safe draft. And so we come up with a plan and said we're going to have uh, the area in green at about 16 feet draft and the area upstream of that is, is 12. And that will be sufficient for handling uh, uh, the uh, fishermen and the local, uh, the local uh, small craft boats. Included in that is this is a transfer site and what that really means is we're going to mechanically dredge um, the harbor. That material will then be transferred to a large barge. That then will be come up and it will be docked up to this, this piece of property here. Those boats that you see slips will have to be temporarily removed in order to be able to have, dock your barges up to the edge. Most likely the railing on there had to be removed and possibly the sidewalk temporarily. And in order to do it that way, because you're going to have hydraulic excavators, you're going to be moving material, and you certainly can't have people walking down there. It'll be for a safety hazard. They'll have to be walking around. The last thing you want is a bucket swinging around, hitting hitting somebody. So most likely this summer, or while this is taking on, it will be there'll be it'll be blocked for for people's safety on that. Once the operation is done, the site will be restored back to its back to its condition. This is uh, the site we're looking at. The, the uh, county is, uh, is willing to provide this site that, that will be developed and be able to place material. It'll hold around 170,000 cubic yards of material. This, uh, this particular site uh, is, is uh, natural clay in this area and will contain the material once the, uh, it'll be excavated out and then we'll be placing material in there. Once that's done, then it will come back and it will be capped by the county after this is set. This is a potential design we're looking at here. You have three cells. One of the reasons we did that is you can fill the first cell uh, quickly and then the county can go back afterwards and cap it and it's, and it's done. Uh, followed by the second cell and the third cell, whether they have one large one and have an exposed out in the open in that, it's just quicker to uh, prevent you know, moisture and rain. You can just, that way we can finish it off quickly. So that's about it. I'm Tom Sear, a project manager with the Short Elliott Hendrickson project team, and uh, we're under contract to the city of Sheboygan uh, to address the uh, Sheboygan River Area Concern uh, Habitat Restoration Projects. We've been under contract uh, since October of last year, uh, and we've made, already made some considerable progress. I do want need to recognize my project team members. Um, I'm a water resources engineer, and I, I believe as an engineer I have some talent, but one of my other talents is to identify a talent that I don't have and recruit it for my project teams. Uh, so I'm very pleased to have a, a pretty broad and diverse uh, project team to help me uh, with these restoration projects, including uh, Interfluve. Uh, this evening is represented by Marty Melcher to my right here. We'll be talking later. Uh, also, Ecological Services of Milwaukee, uh, who is owned by Rose Shimaluski, also here this evening. Uh, Rose is working with Scott Horzen with Otai, who's also, uh, Scott is a resident of the city, uh, lives near the restoration site. She's work he's working uh, very closely with Rose, and other team members include uh, Gary Casper with the Great Lakes Ecological Services, and James Havel with NES Ecological Services. So the three sites that we're looking at are along, again, of course, the Sheboygan River, uh, those being Kiwanis Park. I'm sure everybody here is aware of where Kiwanis Park is located near downtown. Uh, just upstream from there is Wildwood Island, uh, which is an interior island to the river that maybe some of you haven't seen because it's uh, pretty hard to get to. And then further upstream is a broad area near Taylor Drive and Indiana Avenue. And uh, a little later here, Marty will be telling you more about those sites. The overall goal of our project is to address habitat beneficial use impairments. Uh, so you heard, of course, you all know about the Sheboygan area of concern. Uh, in order to get to the area concern status, there is a long list of beneficial use impairments that have been identified. Uh, among those are uh, use impairments that are at a related habitat, a habitat that's been degraded over time for a variety of reasons. Uh, so our project, uh, using GLRI money that was acquired by local stakeholder groups, is to uh, address those BUIs, beneficial use impairments, by in enhancing and increasing habitat along the river providing more habitat for desired wildlife and, and fish species. Uh, moving then uh, to removal of those BUIs and the delisting of the AOC over time. 
Uh, we've been on board since October of last year, and since that time we've done background investigations and assessments, evaluations of hydrology and hydraulics. hydraulics. We've looked at uh, habitat and, and species that are currently living along the river, uh, both fish and uh, wildlife, with, with help from the stakeholder groups, which have also done a considerable background uh, research in those areas. Uh, we have developed uh, conceptual restoration plans, which we're presenting tonight. And our schedule is such that we'll, after tonight, we'll be moving towards the preliminary design of those restoration improvements and then final design, which will result in plans and specifications, which will be delivered to the city towards the end of April. And then the intent is to advertise for a contractor who would construct those improvements during the summer with uh, those improvements being essentially complete by September of this year. So the overall project objective, of course, is to restore, enhance, or protect the connectivity, quality, and quantity of desired fish and wildlife habitat. And beyond the city and the county and the DNR, uh, our real clients are shown here on, on this slide. Our project sites, again, uh, at Kiwanis Park, uh, most downstream site, um, as you're probably all aware of. Uh, further upstream is Wildwood Island. Again, that probably has some of the greatest potential for habitat improvements and is, a, is of course, a challenging site that Marty, again, will talk about. And then further on upstream, uh, Taylor Drive and Indiana Avenue is a broad area uh, along that intersection. The uh, strategies for addressing BUIs, uh, habitat-related BUIs, uh, restoring and enhancing connectivity such that uh, of habitat areas along the river, such that wildlife and fish species can, can move up and down the river at ease and, and thereby um, help expand their habitat and uh, provide diversity along the river. Protecting high quality habitats that, that already exist uh, so they don't get degraded further. Uh, restoring degraded habitat by stabilizing river embankments and also adjacent riparian areas. Uh, reducing erosion and sedimentation to the extent that's appropriate. Uh, providing again uh, in-stream and, and repairing habitat and controlling invasive plant species. That's one of the things that Rose and Scott look uh, heavy at in terms of how you can remove the invasives and then replace those with native vegetation uh, such that we have a an, an better habitat going forward. At this point, uh, Marty's gonna be talking about each one of our sites beginning with the broad conservation targets uh, for restoration. And it's gonna be a pretty quick review, but uh, the three of us, Marty, Rose, and myself, will be right outside that door and we'll have the sites there. We can talk to you at length if you care to talk to us. So thank you. Thanks, Tom. So uh, on your way in, um, you may have seen off to the right when you came in the door, um, the DNR had a, has a booth out there uh, talking about some of the background information that they collected. And so, um, Back from, background information was collected by the DNR and others, and then um, from that, uh, impairments were identified uh, for the various habitats present throughout the system here. And then um, from those, uh, these three publicly owned sites were chosen as opportunities to address some of those impairments. Um, for instance, if you look at this table here, we've got uh, the list of some of those opportunities on the left, and then uh, each of the, if they apply to each of the three sites. For instance, the migratory bird stopover habitat, um, we can apply that to all three sites, for instance, um, improving habitat for bluebirds, songbirds, things like that. Um, so what I'll do now, I guess, is just really introduce the sites and then, um, like Tom said, we'll be outside and can answer any questions you might have. <clears throat> so the Kiwanis Park um, site is pretty heavily used. Um, it's great habitat for people right now, but uh, we kind of want to improve that a little bit for um, the rest of those clients that we mentioned. Um, so there are some stormwater uh, pipes coming in there. Um, we've got some, a lot of concrete and uh, the riparian vegetation for the most part, meaning the vegetation along the, uh, the shoreline, the river side or riparian vegetation has been removed and replaced with turf grass for the most part. Um, and there are a lot of non-native invasive plant species, especially in the upstream and the downstream ends. So <clears throat> uh, here's a picture of the kind of the downstream half of the project, basically. Um, the dark green areas, you can see where we're really concentrating on um, establishing a forested, native forested ecosystem. 
um, a buffer, if you will. And um, we also want to try to comp concentrate public use. So we're not going to impact any of the recreational areas. Um, we don't want to uh, impact softball and, and soccer and things like that. But what we do want to do is just kind of focus on that 30, 40 foot uh, buffer next to the river. So we want to be able to have people get down to the river, uh, but we want to kind of concentrate those areas into a couple of different spots across from the main building area and then the pavilion that's um, just a little bit upstream. <clears throat> Zooming in, um, the yellow areas are areas where we're talking about prairie grass uh, or grassland treatments. Uh, we're really looking to preserve most, if not all, of the weeping willows that are out there um, and the aesthetic that they provide. And they're also really good at holding the banks together too, especially in the um, where we have ice flow in the spring. Um, and then uh, the other areas upstream, there are more opportunities for uh, forested buffer, especially on the very upper end of the project area. Um, and focusing in on this pavilion area, um, thinking about how to integrate more grassland treatment around the, the, the playing fields and perhaps remove some of the concrete. Um, you'll, you'll notice on the right side of the, of the picture there, there's a little tiny stream coming in. Right now there's a big concrete pad that I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. We're thinking about daylighting that uh, little stream so it, it would have flow in it every once in a while after rainfalls. Um, the Wildwood Island site um, is of course the most wild, um, but it's got some problems also. Um, the Wildwood site has, well, that, the Big Island was at one time much larger and has um, slowly eroding and, and the whole site's kind of changing over time. Um, there are some problems there with invasives. Uh, Phragmites, which is a, a giant reed grass. Um, some of you may have seen that along roadsides. It's very tall, has the kind of poofy white uh, heads on it. Um, it's an extremely invasive plant and it propagates itself through roots, so rhizomes, so it's difficult to get rid of. Um, the best way to do that in some cases is to dig it up. So on the downstream end of the island, we're talking about <clears throat> excavating some of that and also on the northwest section of the pro project area, uh, excavating that Phragmites out and get, also getting rid of some of the other invasive species out there and replacing them with uh, native plants. Um, talking about doing some bank stabilization to try and um, mitigate some of the erosion that's occurring on the island and um, try and slow that down. And also um, implementing some fish habitat um, details. And one of the things that we want to do, if you notice there, you can see some little pieces of wood um, which are, in fact, large logs or engineered log jams that we can put in place to create, both create fish habitat and also um, help to change flow patterns or encourage deposition in areas if we want it to or encourage scour in others. Um, so that's kind of the, the gist of that. Um, I can talk more about that in the hallway if you're interested. Um, <clears throat> So the Taylor Drive, Indiana site, there, there was um, it, at the southwest corner of that intersection of Taylor and Indiana, a uh, detention basin was put in uh, many years ago. Um, it's really been taken over by invasive plants and carp are in there and uh, geese use it a lot. So um, it's, it's a degraded wetland. It isn't serving the function that it was uh, really intended to. Um, there's some shoreline and stream bank erosion in this area. Um, and fragmentation of habitat as well. So um, we've got some challenges there because of the roads and we can't really get rid of the roads. So uh, we're going to be working around them. <clears throat> um, in the Esselian Park area, we're not talking about doing a lot, uh, just expanding instead of turf everywhere, uh, some native grassland areas and then a little bit of forested riparian area. Um, we want to preserve some corridors so that uh, people who uh, want to picnic out there or do some fishing um, have access to the river. And also some, uh, just some real minor fish habitat uh, in stream. Um, the pond site's a little more 
uh, intense. Uh, there are four stormwater inputs in this area, and what we want to try and do is um, you can use wetlands to filter out uh, nutrients and pollutants. And so here, here's an opportunity where we can uh, create some pretreatment wetlands, which are these little, uh, the three towards the right of the the picture that have the little uh, stream running down through from them. Uh, we, can, we can capture the flows coming in across the road, pretreat that uh, stormwater, and then the whole area is going to be designed to more positively drain so that carp uh, do not become a problem and that it's more of a, a wet marshy area instead of a, a stagnant pond. Um, you'll notice a lot of different uh, hatches there, and uh, we can talk about it in the hallway if you like, but there are some shrub car areas, some wetlands, some marsh areas, and some forested areas as well as grasslands. So there's a big diversity of habitats there. Um, then downstream uh, on the other side of Taylor, uh, this area is used uh, a little bit by folks who want to park there and launch uh, kayaks or canoes and then also fishing too. Um, it's a popular spot for that. So we thought we would try and enhance some of those opportunities and also gain some habitat features. So uh, concentrating parking there, uh, building some trails down, uh, restoring the native vegetation, and then also enhancing some of the in-stream uh, fish habitat, removing uh, some of the broken concrete that's in the riffles and on the banks and replacing that with more native stone and creating some uh, more riffle pool type features. Um, and um, that's all I have. Uh, like Tom said, we'll be outside. Uh, and I appreciate the opportunity to answer your questions. Thanks. Well, thank you so much for your attention. I would like to offer a few minutes for the folks who um, are staffing some of the displays out in the hallway to make their way out there now so that they're available before everyone else exits. And um, want to just remind you that we have these question and comment sheets. And so feel free to fill these out and turn them in the, in the comment box before you leave. If you want to uh, remember contact information for getting a hold of um, the city development and planning office, just tear off the bottom of this sheet. Also, that information is on the back side of the newsletter, as well as on the bottom of the program for tonight. So if you think of something on your way home or in the next few days or weeks or months, hang on to this perhaps so you know who to contact to ask your question or, or share your thought. Thank you.